Hi guys, welcome to yet another episode of Leverage. I'm Olumde, as you know, your favorite host. And today we're continuing essentially our talk on investments. And we have with us someone pretty interesting. We have Jude DK of Get Equity with us. Thank you for having me. It's an interesting conversation on <laughs> investments. <laughs> so we'll get, we'll get a bit more into that. So before we start, can you just give us a bit about your background? of what you studied and how you got to where you are currently. Okay, so I think I'm one of those people that would say I was a born and bred tech bro. Uh, got my first PC at five. I, I like to say my mother was my first investor because she got my first PC at five. Uh, studied computer science. At that time, I thought I wanted to be a hacker, right? And then, Ethical unfortunately, hacker. kids, don't, just don't try this at home. I went to University of Lagos. And, I mean, I got the whole bass boost out of everything, but... The one thing that Unilag gave me was that it got me interested in... So, I mean, I found out, obviously, quite early that, yeah, hacking is not inside their curriculum. Um, but the very first programming class we had, I mean, these people, just like the normal Nigerian education, it's like, yeah, this is it, this is your assignment, go and figure out how to do it. But I, I remember it was Visual Basic, and... The day I ran my first piece of code, I built my first, it was a, what do they call that thing, almighty formula calculator. But the day I ran that thing, and that thing worked, I felt like God. I, I, I say this all the time, right? I felt like God. It was like, it was like the creation story. I created something out of nothing. And that was a big deal for you. So for me, yeah. And since that time, I, I just got trapped into the world of, uh, programming, creating things, all of that, and all the way from, I mean, this was 2011, so I'd say since then I've been doing this for the past, what, 11 years now, so that's that's pretty much it, that was my first foray into all of these things, and I started getting interested in every new shit that comes up, so I like to say I've lived a couple of lives as a tech bro, this is my this is probably my third life as a tech founder, but let's just leave that one aside. But I've lived a couple of lives as a tech bro. I've done supply chain, I've done finance, I've done AI, I've done, I mean, if you name it, the only thing I've not done is cybersecurity. <laughs> it was the actual thing I wanted to do in the first place, but that's the only thing I've never had the chance to do. Wow, so, so you've essentially had different lives, and you said you're a different three-time founder. And then, so how exactly did you then settle on Get Equity? Get Equity was born out of that. It was born out of the concept of the Web3 ecosystem, or what we call the Web3 ecosystem, ecosystem right now, started out being community funded. It was basically people investing in projects, right? Yeah. And in those projects, I mean, it was ICOs at that time. You would hear uh, a company is doing something, they're doing an initial coin offering, everybody goes to buy, right? Um, but I wanted to be around the people building, not the people buying. Obviously, I bought. Let me, let me not even lie, right? I've gotten the whole bass boost out of cryptos. Is it standard? <laughs> <the dip>. <laughs> I bought the dip that kept dipping and dipped down that I sold. I mean, I sold Ethereum at 25,000 naira one time. My Ethereum is what now? Ethereum is somewhere over 1. something million. So trust me when I tell you that I have chopped bass boost inside of that <laughs> ecosystem. But the one thing that it taught me was I was able to follow the core concepts of what built out the Web3 ecosystem. Now, I mean, if you'd hear, oh, Web3 projects and VCs are pumping $5 million, etc. There was a time when the Web3 ecosystem was, nobody would touch it with a 10-foot pole, right? Yeah. It was self-funded. And so that entire concept is what came about Get Equity. What we're saying is, look, we're looking at emerging markets right now. Africa, the Middle East, um, some parts of Europe, Southeast Asia. Latin America right now is doing a madness, right? Yeah. VCs are pumping money in. But there was a time when even in India, people weren't putting money in. So when you look at India, you look at all these places, you start to see that there's a pattern. Yeah. How did the Indian ecosystem go, um, grow? It was also, Indians were building a lot of, sh a lot of cool stuff. And they kept self-funding themselves. The Israeli market is probably the best in this instance. Now, Israel per capita has some of the most funded startups per capita in the world. And this is in the world where the US is there. 
And how did Israel do this? It was all community driven. And so what the entire concept around gender equity is to bring in that community driven metric. But another thing you start to have is how do you trust, legal, all of that. And that's where we came up with core concepts. Some of that which we borrowed from the Web3 ecosystem. Some of that we borrowed from the VC ecosystem to try to solve one particular problem, which is the funding and growth of venture capital in emerging markets. Sorry, I, I know I've, I've rambled a lot. <laughs> so you've essentially gone back and you've come back to where we are. So, it's, But it's, it's great to just hear how passionate you are about what you're building because I feel like that's one of the most important things. So Get Equity has, I'll say to this first, probably the closest uh, comparison for Get Equity is probably Republic. Yes, Republic, in, we fund a, yes, yes, in that you provide, so it's not stocks, it's tokenized assets which is where the crypto and blockchain comes in, is that you provide tokenized assets in startups. So is that you get a list of startups that you see that you're doing really well, and then you then say, we like to invest in the startups. But we also like to give the community the chance that, okay, they were raising a pre-seed round, they were raising a seed round, and you missed out on it. But now you want to get into the second bridge market, which I think is pretty important because everyone, we know, we've seen what Flutterway was done, Yes. I remember when we were all at home and we just woke up one morning and we heard a Nigerian company has been sold for 200 million. million. If you were paying attention to the Nigerian tech ecosystem, at that point, yes, everyone, 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 everyone's eyes opened. And every, I think everyone thought maybe it's a one-off. And the flutter wave came, I think, in February of 2021. And raised that and So it was, it was absolutely ridiculous. So I think what you're doing is important. But Thank can you. you just tell us why you decided to do startups and community funding instead of going the bamboo and rice vest route of you're just doing traditional securities of ETFs and stocks? Okay, so I think majorly for me is because all my life I have I've worked with startups, right? And I've been opportune to being an early employee at a lot of the startups I've worked with. I mean, some of them now have grown into being $100 million companies, $200 million companies. But that first early onset of where you don't know, you're just in this for this thing is a mad idea. We're all building this stuff. We're trying to get this to one quarter. So there's the adrenaline that comes out of that. I, I, I think in that aspect, I'm kind of an adrenaline junkie because I don't like routine, right? Unfortunately, now I have to be a founder that <laughs> has to create a routine balance. But my usual thrive has always been that first adrenaline, you're pumping out code, your problems are hitting you on a daily. It's, it can be crazy, but it gives an adrenaline pump. Now, the reason why I didn't settle for ETFs and all those markets is because, in my opinion, those are already problems being tackled. Yeah. Right? And there's this large gap. I mean, the ETF, the exchange market, is in itself a trillion dollar market, right? You can still see there can still be companies that will come up today and will still become billion dollar companies still focusing on those markets. I've seen a couple of them. Um, but in the emerging markets, there's literally zero. As I, when we started, there was literally zero company focused around that. I mean, it's, it's both interesting and crazy to be a first mover, right? You have your first mover advantage, but you also have your first mover disadvantage. Because there's no one has done it, so no you, one has you're going into uncharted territory. You're building your roadmap as you go. And it's also with the knowledge that you will make mistakes. There will be people that will come after, after you. you that will learn from their mistakes and based off that are not able to, they wouldn't go through the same wahala that you did. Yeah. You will be hit with different types of baskets that they will learn from. Which, which is an advantage they have that you simply just don't exactly. have. But then the thing also with the first mover advantage is that if you do it right, you own the roadmap. Yeah. And what that means is in that particular industry, when anybody is mentioning is in that industry, your name is always mentioned. Your name becomes the de facto standard. Yeah. So for us, 
that's where we want to be. We want to be the de facto standard in emerging markets. Even, even just the fact that you mentioned emerging markets, I think we're, we're all aware of the fact that last year, African startups raised around, I think it was about $4.9 billion. Nigerian startups raised between 1.4 and 1.7. But if you compare that with, let's say, the American market is even going too far. The Latin American market, I think South America was about $20 billion. It's, it's We're still wild. far behind. In general, emerging markets in general did $57 billion. Africa did $4.9 billion. That's not up to 10%. Yeah. So you can see that there's there's a lot. And even in those, and that's not even talking about the US market in itself. This is just Which is the emerging markets. The US market did almost the same as emerging markets in general. So there's a lot to do. There's a lot that can be done. done. And this is in one year alone. Right now, I, I, I like to tell people that my or my look forward or how I look at things is I like to use the Indian markets. In almost every instance, Nigeria has shown that we're kind of like India five years ago. Whether it was in our tech pipeline, now everybody's trying to get into tech. Ten years ago, when tech wasn't really a thing, it was kind of like it for India. You'd hear a nine-year-old is now Microsoft certified, something like that. And now we're seeing it because now you're seeing tech CEOs, many of them are of Indian origin. We're getting there. They're just even technical teams of how a lot of American companies are known to outsource the technical teams to India. Back that it used to be, oh, just outsource your team to India. Yeah, that was very popular. Now people are starting to look at, oh, it's cheaper to just hire Nigerians. Yeah. I mean, we're getting expensive, but still, it's but, quite cheaper. Yeah. So in that particular instance for us, it's India now has what, 13 unicorns? Africa I don't know about 10. has, no, we have like four. Or five, really? Yeah, well, we're not that many. So the thing is, those, those keep those figures keep changing. So I don't know why, but that's 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 not good. But the the actual truth is, I mean, there are a couple of companies that we maybe from our from how we feel should be unicorns if they were maybe in like the US or something like that. But I mean, time will tell. I think twenty twenty three is probably going to be that year where we mint a couple of unicorns outrightly um, but I feel like in the next five years we would see quite the rise in Africa in the world. yeah that's definitely right. so I, so my next question is it's a bit of a of a two-parter it's first of all I'm going to allow you to the horn of get equity and all the products you have that's the first part and the second one is this year alone everyone has been talking about a downturn in the markets investors are not pumping money into, into it anymore have you seen that person through Get Equity that not as many people are actually funding startups as much as you thought when you're making your projections at the beginning of the year? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, so this it's it's basically pattern matching. Um, now, the average investor or the average angel investor would typically use about twenty percent of their funds of their available funds, right, of their liquidity to angel invest. 50% or 40 to 50% is usually in fixed assets, right? Real estate, all of that sort of stuff. And then maybe like a 30% is in the stock market. But here's the problem with what happened in the stock market. From April, April, May, and you know, most people would put their money in stocks, new stocks right companies are just ipo because you're expecting it's going to balloon a bit before it play twos and just balances but now those stocks that people bought lost 70 percent of their value and this is the stock market which historically people say is less riskier than angel investing so what happens when somebody who put 30 percent of their net worth inside the market that just lost 30 percent and then you're telling them Hey guys, uh, we need more money in this aspect, in this part now. What's up? They look at you like you're crazy. So even funds that typically, yes, were you know doling out cash, were like, look, many LPs. I know of funds where 
help you were like yo yes i know we promised this amount of cash but look at the stock market right now i need to make sure that i can i'm good i need to make sure that i'm good i need to make sure i can weather the storm so maybe lps and lps are limited partners in funds who commit a certain amount right so maybe an lp had committed to providing 200k into a fund they now come and tell you that oh look you know what that 200k i'm not sure i can do that anymore i can maybe do 50. that's not a quarter of what you were really exactly promised. so you have a typical fund that maybe in a year they would invest in 20 startups now they've lost that value by 75 percent so maybe 50 to 75 percent so now they're having to do seven startups instead of 20. and that's on the fund level on the angel investors level as well there's now people saying hey look i mean this is a nice idea and all of that and i wanted to try that when cash was flush but right now i think i'm just going to keep my cash to my chest keep my cash to my chest and we're seeing it um we're also working out alternatives and it's it's a very interesting thing when people say that is during times of crisis that you know the the core businesses are born right and this in itself has helped us have an outlook on how angel investing works and it's helped structure out the kind of products that get equity has so an example is one of them is we started to see that look people still want to invest but many times either they don't have the cash outrightly and are waiting for especially salary earners they're waiting for something else that's where you start to see where some people would love to take credit against their equity so some would love to take credit to invest some people would love to take credit against their equity it's saying yeah i know that i put money inside this company the way the market is right now I need to make sure that I still have cash in the bank, but I still like the fact that my money inside this company is going to do well, but then I need cash to weather the storm. So if I could get credit against my equity inside a company, I can use that cash to weather the storm. And I know that in the next two years, it will pay off because that company would probably have gone 3x the amount that I put in. So it wouldn't matter. If I had to pay back that loan, maybe I'm paying back the loan at a 30% interest rate. At the end of the day, when I do my math, I'm still making over 1.5x on that company by the time this whole, should I say, crisis is done. Then we started to see how, what are the ways that, yes, we say venture capital is a very risky um, industry. What are the ways where we can try to de-risk as much as possible? Yes, de-risking is trying to find the best companies, etc. But on other instances, there are things that are beyond your control. And that's where we started to look at. It's, we started to look at what types of insurance can you give on equity? And <laughs> And it was it was a very funny conversation I was having with um, a company called Curacao, the YC back company, and then they mentioned to me that yeah, there's there's a type of insurance that you can do that on startups. It's called a key man insurance, and what that means is saying that even though typically um, you know, typically anything can happen, just like with your car insurance, yeah. right? You can be driving one day, there's a flood. You didn't plan for it. Brain box is gone. But because you have an insurance that is that caters towards that, it covers it. Now we're looking at Cayman Insurance, where for the early stage companies, the most volatile pieces of an early stage company is the founders. For many times, if the founder of a company that is less than two years old, if something happens to the founder, the business more or less is not structured enough to survive that. So if the founder dies, if the founder is has a disability all of that the founder just says i'm tired and i'm going home <laughs> so for instances like that we now started to look at um there is an instance that occurs in evolved markets called key man insurance and what that means is that the key man the key person of a startup 
is insured against specific um, situations. So it could be death, it could be um, disability, permanent disability, etc. And these are the type of things that we are now coming out with, right? And lastly, then this is my favorite actually, because I've always talked about it a long, long time ago, is the idea of stock options. Now, uh, it's not something that in this part of the world is a uh, is a conversation starter, but like you said, we woke up one morning and found out that a company was sold for 200 million. We didn't just find out that they were sold for 200 million. Everybody who is maybe in tech kind of had heard of Paystack, right? You had seen Paystack employees. You had seen how happy they are working where they are, right? And I mean, a lot of people wanted to work at Paystack. The mind-blowing aspect was finding out that, oh, a lot of Paystack employees had stock options. They had something called stock options. And what that meant was that the, as the company got paid out, even with their good salaries, <laughs> it goes they still got a good payout. And now we have people looking like, oh, sh- what the hell is this called? This thing called stock options? And now we're starting to see a lot more companies integrate this. But the problem with stock options is not everybody is going to be a Paystack right yeah not everybody is going to get to that angle um we saw even with flutterwave becoming a unicorn there were employees in flutterwave that had stock options the original and, employees yes and now we're seeing that oh, even those people too can sell their own equity but now we're getting to a point where yes they can sell their equity but you want to also make sure that the employees are good the founders are good and all of that. In, an, in a situation where there's not enough bias for that equity, you start to see situations where someone will say, oh, this person didn't pay me enough, but I didn't know. This person bought my equity at a low price, but then I didn't know because, well, they were the only one willing to buy it. And that's where um, we're having conversations with a couple of um, startups, with a couple of much larger entities, where it's saying, we can provide that infrastructure. The core angle of debt equity is a secondary market, right? So if you can have a secondary market for startup equity, you should also be able to have a secondary market for employee equity. At the end of the day, it's all still equity. Yeah. So these are things that, I mean, the turndown has, has allowed us to see that, yes, um, even within you can still find ways to make money. You can still find ways to grow a venture ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah. So, like we saw this year, everyone in the last two years, every, like you said, the dip in the crypto market, which was pretty bloody for a lot of people, and the stock market came along. I don't want it would seem to be worse. I, like I saw, I saw a startup up last week about I think twenty percent of companies that have over I think it's about five billion in market cap, they experienced eighty percent loss yeah, in their it, stock. In their it was stock that value. bad. It was that bad. So I just, we had companies that were raising a down round. Um, private companies that were, I can't remember. Is it Klarna that went from forty five billion to five? How do you put that in your like? How do you even talk about that? Where do you want to start from? Yeah. So I feel like the, people just need to acknowledge that both markets are risky. One just seems one just seems to have made. I think what there's actually more alike than they are different. The first movers into the stock markets they made a lot of money. Yes. The first movers into the crypto market they also made a lot of money. Shit ton of money. And the thing is, I think the different. It's the it's the same thing. You have meme coins like you have Doge, you have Shiba. I'm sure that they were equivalent of meme stocks. As yeah, well. you have meme stocks. We said the AMC. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Meme. <laughs> But kind of, yeah, it's the same thing. You and what what we all need, what, what we all try to do is make sure that we try to find the best of yeah. startups. Um, we try to find the best of situations. But then, I think the biggest aspect of this is also investor education. Yeah, because I know your website. Day, you say a lot that it's go big or go. At the end of the day, look, you cannot. You cannot downplay investor education. It's it's the biggest aspect of it. And it, again, it's one of the reasons why regulators, to be very honest, from their own standpoint as well, 
um, one of the reasons why they tend to be um, they tend to be very cagey is that things that have to do with the mass market for them it's as little any little thing can affect the glo- the Nigerian economy in general. So because once there's a small panic in like startups or something, well, it goes it, it checks out a lot and. For them, they're looking at it like look, our older startups, the unicorns and the large guys, are five years old. I mean, our banks are typically since the 1990s, since the 1980s. So they tell you that uh, these people have they have a track record. You know, they've grown with all these things. But you guys, you guys haven't done anything. You guys are just new. How old are you? <laughs> I'm sure that's a question that you. You, you, you've been in meetings that you heard a lot of how old are you? How, how old even are you? People are just asking yeah, all these young men. You people should. I mean, we understand. So, final question: w- What do you see in Get Equity's future between the next three to five years? I mean, the easiest thing would be would be me saying unicorn. Uh, but I would say what we want to be is the pioneer secondary market in for emerging markets. I want to be the um, I don't know if you watched what they call this movie again, where they were trading pink slips. Uh, the Wolf of Wall Street. Wolf of Wall Street. Obviously, I don't want to be that. I don't want to snort coke. Um, but there, if you notice in the US, there was the regular Nasdaq and everything. But these guys weren't trading those markets. They were trading smaller, small. They were trading a secondary market for pink slips, companies that weren't yet ready to IPO. That is exactly what we want to be. We want to say, in the emerging markets covering these different continents whatsoever, we want to be that core exchange for startups across all these continents. Okay, great. So, so we know that your first thing, like you already already talked about, first mover, you want to be kind of a, a republic for more, for more emerging markets, particularly in Nigeria here where we see every day it's like every new week you just wake up you check all the all the particular all the known suspects of where people get their news about startups and you see that a new Nigerian startup that you've never heard of has raised has something raised million something crazy and yeah. you're like wh- where are these guys coming from it's like you're just generating a new one every week and the same way we're looking at it is the same way the traditional guys are looking at it as well and are saying yeah how can I also get in on this because look to be honest they also want to make money. Yeah. They also want to make money. They also like some of those ideas that they would love to partner with. So, but the more we keep doing this separation of an us versus them, it's never going to happen. And to be very honest, yes, we like to say that we want to scale and everything, but you can't scale without partnerships. And money. And money. I mean, and money. Yeah. So thank you very much, uh, Jules. Great, great speaking with you and learning more about Get Equity and just about the outlook of the Nigerian ecosystem as well. Thank you guys for watching this interview. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And visit our website at leverage.thebob.africa for more content. See you next time.